This video is going to be about signal transduction and second messengers. So whenever our ligand binds to the extracellular uh, domains of these receptors, we call that ligand our primary messenger. But since that primary messenger can't actually get across the membrane onto the inside of the cell, we need uh, something else to do more work for us. And so those are gonna be our second messengers. So second messengers are gonna be water-soluble molecules that can diffuse through the cytoplasm and actually elicit a cellular response. So two really common second messengers are going to be cyclic AMP or CAMP and calcium ions. So let's start with cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP um, is gonna be produced through a GPCR signaling pathway. So we'll have our ligand that will bind to our GPCR. And when that happens, that's gonna cause um, our G protein to exchange a GDP for a GTP. Now this G protein is activated and it can diffuse across the inside of the membrane to activate this enzyme right here. So this enzyme, is called adenylyl cyclase. And what adenylyl cyclase is gonna do is it's gonna convert ATP into cyclic AMP. And so this is our really important second messenger. So when we have this happening, our uh, cytoplasmic concentrations of cyclic AMP go up drastically in a really short amount of time. So this is gonna play a big role in signal amplification. So if we just have one receptor that's activated and we're producing just one or a couple molecules of cyclic AMP, the cell's not really gonna do anything and it's not gonna really respond to that because the signal isn't above a particular threshold. But when we have this happening, um, there's gonna be production of multiple molecules of cyclic AMP very rapidly, as well as you'll have the same process going on on different GPCRs on other spots on the cell. So all of this is going to go, um, uh, go on at the same time, and so our cyclic AMP concentrations inside the cell are gonna get really high, and that's what's actually gonna cause the cellular response. So cyclic AMP will then often go on to activate a serine threonine kinase called protein kinase A. which can then take place in a phosphorylation cascade and phosphorylate other kinases or other enzymes to eventually bring about the cellular response. So now that we've looked at cyclic AMP, we'll look at um, another important one with IP3 and calcium. So again, this pathway is gonna be activated by um, a GPCR. So we'll have the ligand bind we'll have the G protein become activated, and instead of going to adenylyl cyclase this time, it's going to go to something called phospholipase C. So phospholipase C, instead of converting ATP to cyclic AMP like adenylyl cyclase did, is actually going to diffuse across the membrane and cleave a molecule um, that's called PIP2 into two molecules, one called DAG that will stay in the membrane and can also play a role in signaling, and then one called IP3. And so IP3 is gonna be the really important one in this pathway. So what IP3 will now do is it will go to the endoplasmic reticulum and bind to a ligand-gated calcium channel. And so when it binds to this channel, it causes the gate to open so calcium can flow out of the lumen of the ER and into the cytoplasm. So the endoplasmic reticulum is a really important place that we store calcium in our cells. And so when we get this huge release of calcium out of our endoplasmic reticulum, it can cause a lot of different things. Um, for example, muscle contraction is caused by calcium uh, coming out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the ER in a muscle cell. And so um, this signaling through IP3 and uh, calcium flooding into the cytoplasm of the cell is a uh, really important second messenger. Um, pathway. So um, through both of these processes, we're going to get signal amplification because we're going to have a huge increase in these second messengers that can then activate multiple different things to bring that signal um, to the cell and actually cause a cellular response. And so the last thing that we're going to look at is something called a scaffolding pro protein. So scaffolding proteins are going to be proteins that hold other proteins in a particular arrangement to make signal transduction easier. 
So for example, if we have this protein right here, it can hold, let's say, three protein kinases that are in the signaling pathway all right next to each other. That way, when this one becomes activated, it can activate the next one, and then the next one, and so on and so forth, and it just makes the entire process of signal transduction much quicker and uh, more efficient. And then, um, like I mentioned earlier with the threshold, when we talk to, about termination, what's gonna happen is you're no longer gonna have enough uh, receptors being activated because ligands are um, binding reversibly to these receptors, and so once they dissociate, the signal um, drops back down below that threshold and eventually the entire pathway will uh, stop. I hope you found this video really helpful. The concepts and information presented in these videos will be true regardless of what biology course you're taking. However, the material we covered in this video is specifically referencing material covered in Campbell Biology's 11th edition. Remember that if you are an enrolled Baylor student, we do offer free tutoring on the first floor of the Sid Richardson building, and you can schedule a free 30-minute appointment to have one-on-one -on -one tutoring online, or you can stop by during any of our business hours. For more information about the services we provide, you can go to our website at www.baylor.edu tutoring. Thank you.